the most important thing to know as uh, human beings in the 21st century is that we are now hackable animals. And this is the result of the combination of two enormous scientific and technological revolutions, as a revolution in infotech and the revolution in biotech, which in the past decades have evolved separately, but are now combining uh, to a single revolution, which, as I said, results in really the ability to hack human beings. There is a lot of talk about hacking computers and smartphones and emails and bank accounts, but the really important ability is to hack the human animal. And this is based on the insight that is coming not from AI, not from infotech, but the insight that is coming from the biological sciences that organisms are really algorithms. And therefore, algorithms can hack organisms. Uh, for those who like equation, equations or understanding reality in the shape of equations, then the equation I can offer to understand what's happening in the world right now is B times C times D equals R, which means biological knowledge multiplied by computing power multiplied by data equals the ability to hack humans. Now, to hack a human being means to understand, let's say, me better than I understand myself. To understand what I feel, what I think, what I want better than I understand it. And once this is possible, it means that whoever understands me better than I understand myself can not only predict my decisions and choices, but can also manipulate my decisions and choices, and increasingly take decisions on my behalf. It means the shifting of authority from humans to algorithms. Now, a lot of governments and corporations and institutions throughout human history had this ambition to understand and control humans. But it was never really possible because they never had the biological knowledge, the computing power, and the data necessary to do it. Even just a few decades ago, let's say the KGB in the Soviet Union, the KGB could follow you around everywhere 24 hours a day, uh, observing, recording, who are you talking with, where you go, what you do. But the KGB did not have enough biological knowledge, enough computing power, and enough data to really decipher what was happening within you, what was happening inside your body, inside your brain, inside your mind. Now, for the first time in human history, and if not now, then in 10 or 20 years, at least some corporations and some governments will have enough biological knowledge, enough computing power, and enough data to systematically hack millions and even billions of people. And if this happens, and if we don't take countermeasures, this could mean the end of liberal democracy as we've known it, and the end also of free market economics as we've known it. Um, liberal democracy is based on the inside that the voter knows best, and that the voter is the ultimate authority in the political field, and uh, free market economics is based on the idea that the customer is always right. That the ultimate authority in the field of economics is the desires of the customers. So the government, the political government, should represent the will of the people, and the corporations should serve the will, the desires of the customers. But what happens if the government and the corporation cannot just anticipate the will and desire of the voters and customers, but also manipulate and control them. And this is not a hypothetical question. And questions about human agency and about the very meaning of free will, whether there is such a thing, have bothered philosophers for thousands of years. There is nothing new about the philosophical arguments. What is new is the technology. We now have, or we will soon have, 
the technology uh, that will enable governments and corporations to manipulate and control the will of the voter and the desire of the customer like never before. And then who represents who? It's not clear. Again, I don't want you to think about it as a kind of doomsday prophecy because it's not inevitable. Technology always gives us options, not an infinite amount of options, but there are always different options. You can use the same technology to create very different kinds of societies. We saw this in the 20th century, when with the same technology of the Industrial Revolution, with trains and electricity and radio and television and cars, some people created communist dictatorships. Other people created fascist regimes. And other people created liberal democracies. They all use the same technology. It's the same with the new tools of the 21st century. Information technology and biotechnology can be used to create completely different kinds of societies. Really all the spectrum from paradise to hell. The important thing at the present moment is to realize the true potential of these technologies and to really start the political debate about these issues. Engineers and scientists in places like this may realize the true potential of the new inventions, of the new discoveries. But the political system and most of the public has still hasn't realized what we are facing, what the new inventions and technologies really mean. So it's the job of historians and philosophers and social scientists to form a bridge between the engineers and the geneticists and the biologists and the general public and to really change the public conversation, change the political conversation. I think that this should be one of the most important issues in every elections around the world, in every public discussion around the world. And what I see as an historian, unfortunately, is that too much of the political discussion in most countries around the world is focused on the issues of the past and not on the issues of the future. And that too many politicians are simply unable or unwilling to form a meaningful vision for the future of humankind. If in the 20th century, politics was a great battle between visions for the future, good, bad, that's a different question. But in the 20th century, it was very obvious that politics was about the future. And you had the communist vision, the fascist vision, the liberal vision, and the political struggle was a struggle between these visions for the future. Now, almost nobody in any part of the political spectrum offers a really meaningful vision for where humankind will be in 20 or 30 years. What, most of what they offer is really just nostalgic fantasies about going back to an imaginary past. Um, and this is a very, very dangerous situation because it really means that maybe the most important decisions in the history of humankind are taken either by a small group of specialists who represent nobody, or they are not taken by anybody. They just happen. And this, again, may be part of this process of shifting authority from humans to algorithms. In 2019, it is still, humans still have agency, but we don't have a lot of time. Uh, within our lifetime, this shift, for, shift of authority from humans to algorithms might reach a point when most humans are simply incapable of understanding what is happening in the world. Even most governments and heads of state will not be able to really understand what is happening in the world. And more and more decisions will be taken on our behalf by algorithms. 
which is why the question who designs these algorithms and on what, an eth on, in, in, on what ethical basis is extremely crucial. So I hope that the discussion we have today in the coming hour or so will help not just to enlighten us about these issues, but to really spark a public conversation and a political conversation about this. Because again, to, as maybe as a last remark before we really begin the debate, to take a long-term historical perspective, there is always a connection between technology and politics. Technology often defines what are the main political issues of the day. In ancient times, the most important asset in the world was land, and the most sophisticated technologies were the agricultural technologies, which was a basis for agricultural societies. So politics was largely a struggle to control land. Then, with the Industrial Revolution, the most important asset in the economy changed from land to machines and factories. And politics over the last two centuries increasingly became a struggle to control the machines, the factories, the industry. Now data is replacing machines as the most important asset in the world. And the main political struggle is no longer about machines, it's about data. 